Hey, it's Mike here, and today, my response to your vegan battles, yes, those anti-vegan talking points that have been used against you by friends, family, and acquaintances. I did a YouTube community post asking you guys, the subscribers, what you have heard, and there are, as of now, about a thousand comments, so not gonna get to all of them. Some of these claims that I'm gonna be addressing are ones that you may have heard before, but I'm gonna try and make a concise response or approach it from a different angle, but some of them are just obscure, and yeah, these are things you might just randomly here, taken off guard by a coworker back when we used to work in the same place as each other. Oh, hey, Tammy, you made it into work. Glad to see you're feeling better. Glad to see it. Oh, the vegan, hey, yeah, I'm back. I see what you're saying though, because I'm not vegan, that's why I get sick. But you know what, guess what, guess what, guess what? My body says intuitively I need to eat meat and animals would overpopulate the earth if we did not eat them. Uh, that's not really what I was saying. Also, Ayurved said dairy is sacred, so I need to drink cow's milk. And then also, Miley said that fish is good, so I started eating anchovies for breakfast. Um, mm, one animal life gone. <laughs> Slurp, two animal lives taken. <laughs> Tammy, wh why are you doing this to me? <laughs> mm, three animal lives taken, so slippery and crunchy in my mouth. Mm. Anyway, I was thinking that there's no long-term vegan population throughout history, that you should actually just kill yourself now because you're gonna die young anyway. Tammy, look, you might've won this battle, but you have not won the war. I will watch Mike the Vegan's video and learn how to respond to you. <laughs> I know nobody probably needed that skit. Oh wait, there was one person out there that needed it. It was all worth it just for you. I'm not gonna claim that these are gonna be the best possible responses. And it again, always depends on the person that you're talking to. If they're emotionally in the deep woods of deer hunting and being completely desensitized and not caring about animals, then you might have a harder time getting through to them than somebody who's you know on the cusp of being plant-based, obviously. Anyway, having good response to these people's claims, even if you're coming back a few hours later or a couple days later, I think certainly helps move them even an inch into the right direction. And yeah, it's a piecemeal process. We like to think that everyone would just go vegan when we tell them something that is logical, but everybody moves at their own pace. Anyway, enough rambling, let's just get into it. The first one is one that I haven't really talked about on this channel in any meaningful way. And that is from Jakara Droog saying, why do vegans eat fake food that looks like the real thing? The implication here is a lot of vegans eat mock meats and vegan veggie burgers and things like that. And that's just proof that they are desperately craving real animal flesh. The first angle that is a good response, I think, is to just mention that people grew up eating these textures and flavors, and so nostalgically they might want to continue eating them, but the part that they don't want is the dead animal part, and they can have both, no dead animals, and still getting those tastes and textures. You can have your burger and not eat the cow too. But what I think is another valid angle is saying that actually people that are eating meat are distorting the animal that they're actually eating. They compartmentalize all these different parts of the animal and euphemistically avoid actually referring to the animals that they eat and reshape these animals into something that doesn't look like the animal did originally. Unlike predators that just naturally go at the whole carcass, it's gross, but the idea is you can turn the whole thing around here because really a lot of these animal foods are re-engineered to arguably look like plant foods. For example, you have the burger, which instead of this large cow, all of a sudden becomes this handheld round object that actually sort of resembles fruit. Instead of the whole chicken, people go and eat the drumstick, which, you know, looks a little bit maybe like a pear or a mango, it's handheld like that. Then you also have chicken nuggets looking nothing like a chicken and almost a little bit more like some of those wild fruits that would be picked off the tree. The way people cut ribs might bear an uncanny resemblance to bananas. You decide. Yes, so maybe you meat eaters are repressing your natural instincts to eat these handheld plant foods. Ever think about that? See, checkmate. Next up, a lot of likes for Sprout Bliss's comment, familiar face there. She reiterates the claim that eating vegan is a rich white person trend that has no tradition or history beyond the present decade. Please, has anyone heard of the Janes? I once got into a discussion with a Jane where they said they actually avoid cultured foods like probiotics because they could have more of a microbe death toll than foods that are not cultured. However, the sad reality is that a lot of Janes still eat dairy, they've justified it. But yeah, Jainism has been around since like the eighth or seventh century BCE. So it's been around for a while. And that is to say that at least the Ahimsa or do not harm others philosophy that 
underpins veganism has definitely been around for a long time. But this is once again a classic appeal to history fallacy in this case that because it didn't happen in history to some large degree, therefore it shouldn't happen. And so if you're going to live by those tenets, you have to also ditch things that weren't happening in the past. Like, you know, maybe stop using toilets and running water and electricity and just see how that works out. And even if for the sake of argument you were to grant that this was just a white person trend, well, there's probably a lot of white person trends or things that historically started as white person trends that they have absolutely no problem with. Like the automobile or bicycles, with all those rich top hat people around on them originally. Sorry to interrupt, but guys, can we, can we appreciate this? I just searched for early bicycle and a few pictures down, I get whites on bikes, an article about race and exclusivity and early biking. Not a bad point. You get what I'm saying, this is not an excuse on its own to reject veganism, but in reality, there is a large vegan black community that is spearheaded by amazing people like Tabitha Brown and so many more. So to say it's just a white trend is sort of erasing or at least ignoring these people. And if people haven't been vegan for a long time is really a health concern, it's just worth noting the lower vegan disease rates and lower vegan mortality rates, which could use more statistical power, but definitely powerful for vegan men in particular from the Adventist studies, very statistically significant. All right, next, Shannon B and user Light Mer I think that's how you say it, have more or less the same point here saying, quote, my body tells me it needs meat or I could never be vegan. I need meat for my body. I don't want to like gaslight and deny people's own bodily feelings here, but the classic response, which is very valid, is that, you know, what if my body is telling me to eat donuts three times a day? And I would go further and say that people listening to their bodies is why we have 100 million obese adults in the US alone. So while you should take note of what your body is saying, you should also use things like science and logic and what the experts in the field are saying. For example, is there something that you need in meat that you can't get by not eating meat? Absolutely not. If it's iron, you can get that from plants. If it's B12, we can get that from bacteria like it is anyway in meat. You know, my body is often just code for I do what I want. Anyway, my body though also has an implication that this person is somehow physiologically different. No, my, your body might be able to do it, but my body can't. And that brings me to another one of your guys' statements, which was from Black Rose and UK, Black Rose neck, I don't know. Everybody has different nutrient needs and some people need to consume animals. Said it before and I'll say it again, there is no vitamin meat. I mean, looking to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the largest organization of nutrition professionals in the world, they say that an adequately planned vegan diet is suitable for everybody, all human beings. You're not a lion person. And really when we're thinking about the RDA of various nutrients, they are overshooting. And I don't say that to make people feel like, oh, I don't actually need to meet the RDA. You still should. But yeah, people might have a natural small variation in what is needed in terms of nutrients. And maybe we're talking about iron for women being a little bit higher. That is taken into account in the RDA. It's all within that variability. And I think this is one where we can just shift the burden of proof and say, show me a good case for why somebody needs to eat meat or what nutrient is it in meat that you cannot get from plants or make on your own in an adequate amount. And that becomes a hard case for meat, especially when you look at populations like the Adventist vegetarians who just live significantly longer. Why did they do that? Your case is weak. All right, here's a classic that I've touched on before, but it was one of the most popular upvoted ones. So I will respond to it. And this is from Ryan Vargas and really a bunch of people said it. If you don't eat animals, then they will overpopulate the world. Da, 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 da. Firstly, I just want to say I have a video that goes into this in depth and most people haven't seen it because I named it something sort of counterintuitive when looking for this topic. So I changed the title to include animal overpopulation in that title. I will link it below if you want to go more deeply into it. There are a few angles here and you can just take the shocker response angle and say, actually, farm animals are already overpopulated because people eat meat. We feed about half of the world's grain to these animals. Now they use nearly a third of our ice-free land and a third of our fresh water on earth. So you, know, you seem to be okay with this. So what are you afraid is gonna happen? The smug tone is always what gets the point through. It's the most persuasive, I'm joking. But what is probably a more common answer, and I've mentioned this before, I mentioned this even in a recent video, is that we aggressively breed billions of animals a year to eat or use for their products. And so we can just stop doing that and the population will go down. But the counter to that is usually, oh, 
You want these animals to go extinct? You're worse than me who eats these animals. And that's obviously a straw man because vegans love animals. We would just get these farm animals to a manageable population and then have animal sanctuaries and everything would be great. Hashtag so frickin' stainable. All right, now on to the next one, which is quote, meat slash milk slash eggs from small farms is healthy. It's the factory products that aren't healthy. I have no problem admitting there could be a bit of a difference in certain cases between these two different types of farming in terms of the biochemical makeup of that animal product Product, but you have to admit that that can slice both ways. For example, organic cow's milk has some more estrogen in it than non-organic cow's milk. But then for the most part, these animal products are identical. You know, an egg from a battery hen or an egg from a pasture-raised chicken, they both still have about 200 milligrams of cholesterol in them. And there's a whole grass-fed beef, yay. Well, they've started feeding these factory-farmed cows grass pellets, which changes that biochemical makeup a little bit. And the omega grass-fed thing was overblown anyway. There's a measly amount, laughably low amount of omegas even in grass-fed beef. And either way, you're looking at red meat, which is classified as a carcinogen by the WHO. So it's all just this romanticization of small farms, which when you really look at under a microscope, it still has a lot of problems. You know, your local ghee or clarified butter is still going to have pretty much all saturated fat in it. It's not good. You know, it's horrible for you. And also ghee is prized in Ayurveda, which brings me to another little bit more obscure. You know, you're not gonna hear this one a lot, a little more obscure one. And that's quote, my mom, lacto vegetarian, is a yoga teacher and she believes in Ayurveda and uses it to claim that cow's milk is the purest, most nutritious elixir. <laughs> of course, recommending it and saying it goes back to the mythological age of people religiously drinking cow's milk. I actually grew up around a lot of like pseudo Hindu white people who worshiped dairy to an extent. And the reality is, regardless of how much reverence you have for that main source of saturated fat in the diet, it's still the main source of saturated fat and even higher saturated fat intake in these people that really think it's healthy. But of course, when you're talking about somebody who has a religious belief, you can't always use logic on them and it's really hard to talk to these people. But sometimes you can talk from their perspective. For example, maybe there is a negative karmic effect of continuously re-impregnating these cows in which they over and over again have calves, half of which have no place in the dairy industry, you think it is karmically wrong to be eating beef and cows in general, yet the dairy industry is the beef industry and the veal industry too. So where's the karma there? No, so their dairy money is directly going to the beef industry. I have a local sort of spiritual dairy and guess what? Uh, the male calves go to 4-H and end up being eaten for beef. Anyway, we could dwell on this, but I think you get the point. So I guess the main point here is however much you're trying to romanticize the dairy industry, there's gonna be something that is not right with it because that's how animal exploitation on that level works. Anyway, moving on to the next one by Hanoday, Han Ode 314, I don't know. Your body needs A1 protein found in milk, courtesy of my aunt. I love the courtesy of my aunt part because that was mentioned several times also by a Miss Lauren who said, I could never eat that way. I'm a carnivore, said my aunt. So everyone's aunt is apparently Tammy from work. If your name's Tammy, not you, the other Tammy. I'll just answer this one quickly. The majority of humans on planet Earth, about 70% of them are lactose intolerant, meaning they have absolutely no need unequivocally for dairy proteins of any kind. So why would you as a human require these dairy proteins? It's just logically doesn't make any sense. And to evolve upon this point, we have another one from Kushbu Didania. Got that right, nailed it. <laughs> if you drink A2 cow's milk, it's not bad for you. A1 milk causes health issues, but not A2. So the point here is that the autoimmune concern for A1 just might not be the same for A2 casein. You know, it might just not have the same level of molecular mimicry, but that's one of a whole host of issues with dairy. Again, main source of saturated fat. It doesn't matter whether it's A1 or A2 cow's protein, it's still saturated fat, which raises cholesterol, which contributes to heart disease or number one killer, you get it. I would also add it's the cow's milk profile for whatever reason, whether it's hormones in there or the protein alone that raises IGF-1 in the human body, which again, fuels every stage of cancer and excess. So there's a lot of reasons going on here, not just A1 versus A2. Here's a fun newer one, which is mushrooms can feel. The implication here is, oh, vegans say they don't wanna do any harm, but since mushrooms are like sentient, 
you're eating them and harming them. And I've actually heard this one more and more, and it's really a result of us learning more about these mycelial networks of fungi, which are very responsive and they are pretty impressive, but it appears they're along the same lines of amazing plants having these amazing abilities to react and communicate, but that does not mean that they are sentient to a level where they are suffering or that they have a need evolutionarily to suffer when you pluck a mushroom. Unlike animals who have a central nervous system and have been well documented to suffer, yet people decide to still eat and don't really care about it. So it's just, it's kind of a deflection. Finally, like plants, mushrooms can't run away. So there's no evolutionary drive or need for them to adapt to feeling pain and respond to that. All right, here's another one that I saw in various forums. And this is so-and-so went vegan and they lost their hair slash nearly died. Can you imagine if they applied the same logic to this diet that they are currently eating, this diet that is responsible for at least in the US, 600 thousand deaths from heart disease a year. Like they would quit instantly. I'm not here to say that vegans are gonna be invincible or not have any health problems, but from pretty much all of the epidemiological data, we can see a lower trend toward all of these diseases. And again, mortality, lower. So to be quitting a vegan diet based off somebody else's health concerns or deem a vegan diet bad because people have some health issues is just completely illogical. All right, here's another one that definitely needs to be nipped right in the butt. And that was forwarded by Vinny Rodriguez. But soy causes cancer. Oh, this couldn't be further from the truth. Soy is associated with lower levels of cancer, in particular breast cancer from this paper, which is a really compelling they observed a 33% lower death rate in the highest versus lowest soy consumption groups. More soy equals less death, apparently, from cancer. Yeah, these five-year breast cancer mortality numbers are honestly chilling chillingly better. Now, and who knows how much of it is replacing meat with animal protein in the form of soy, or if it's actually direct benefits of soy itself, probably both. Anyway, but but what about men though? Wouldn't their prostate from all the soy just become a little ball of wussy cancer? Sorry, that sounded kind of bad, but looking to the studies from this meta-analysis, total soy food, soy phytoestrogens, and unfermented soy intakes were associated with a reduced risk of prostate cancer. Cancer. And I found it kind of funny that even the American Institute for Cancer Research debunked this claim. So not a particularly vegan organization, boom, destroyed. So soya no causa cancer, cancer. Anyway, moving on to Purple Potamus's gripe, great name by the way, they say, quote, you're so preachy like a born again Christian because I asked if we could do a vegan challenge for dinner. My whole family has dinner every Sunday and we do themes and challenges. Imagine actually using this logic to reject a school of thought that is widely accepted to be right. For example, you would never be like, I'm gonna be a racist or a child predator because people who aren't racist or child predators are a little too preachy. That sounds ridiculous. No, I don't think women should be able to vote because dang, some of those suffragettes, they were just a little pushy. And I think part of Purple Potamus's point is that you don't even have to do anything abnormal or ridiculous to be considered preachy as a vegan. Like, oh, we're doing challenges. What do you want to do? Oh yeah, how about we just have a vegan meal? <laughs> Stop pushing your ideals on me. I would also say that preachiness as a category of a group is a bit of a result of observation bias, just the idea that you're more likely to observe the behavior of the most extreme person in that group. It's a problem with all groups. Anyway, there are so many more good ones and thank you guys for sharing those. I would like to address more, but I think I'm gonna cut it off here. I could do another part two or a follow-up to this at some point if you guys liked it. And I will say a lot of these I have addressed in videos. I know it's nice to have a quick response, but in case yours wasn't addressed, you can just type in what you were thinking, Mike the Vegan in the YouTube bar. For example, veganism is privilege into the YouTube bar and boom, I got a video on that. Who would have thought? Speaking of thanking people, I haven't mentioned my Patreon supporters in like 10 or 20 videos. So thanks so much for that support. It really keeps this a smooth operation. All right, that's it for today. Let me know what you thought. Let me know if you have better answers than I had to some of these because there's no way I had the best answer. All right, like the video if you liked it, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one. <laughs> oh, honey, I didn't buy a single response Mike the Vegan just gave because vegan research bias, George Soros, anti-nutrients though. <laughs> Get away, you're making me feel guilty. <laughs>